Good afternoon. The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Members and presenters, uh, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking. At this time, will our secretary please proceed to call the roll? Senator Brooks. Here. Senator Goikachia. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Senator Scheibel. Here. Chair Donate. And I am here. So let the record reflect that we're all present. So welcome everyone to the Senate Committee on Natural Resources. Now for anyone who has not participated in these virtual legislative meetings yet, I will quickly explain how these virtual committee meetings are being conducted for the 2021 session. As you know, the legislative building is currently close to the public, so all committee meetings will be held virtually, meaning that committee members, staff, and everyone else will participate either through Zoom video conference or by telephone. However, there are various ways that members of the public can engage with us, including by this process that I will detail below. As in previous sessions, all committee-related information is available on a Nevada Electronic Legislative Information System, or NELIS, which is accessible from the legislature's website. There are four main ways that you can engage with our committee. This includes registering to participate in a committee meeting through the NELA system, which places you in line to testify on a bill or provide public comment during the meeting, submitting written testimony to the committee's email address or fax number listed on the agenda, sharing your opinion via legislature's opinion application on NELAS or viewing committee meetings online through NELAS or on the legislature's YouTube channel. To testify on a bill or provide public comment during the 2021 legislative session, members of the public must first register for the meetings that you would like to participate in. Committee meetings are listed on several places on NELIS. To register, simply click on the participate button near the meeting date and time, then go ahead and fill out the required information. But just as a note that while registration is required to participate, it does not guarantee you a spot to speak. And similar to previous sessions, testimony and public comment may be limited due to time constraints. When you are on the phone line, please pay attention to which bill is being considered on the today's meeting agenda and follow the verbal prompts. Of course, today is a work session, so you will listen to what keys to press whenever we get to the public comment section. These are the instructions for participating in meetings are also listed on the help page, which is linked in the banner at the top of every page on Nellis. And if you ever need any assistance with any of these processes, or if you'd like to receive an electronic notification of the committee's agendas and minutes, always feel free to please contact our committee manager at the committee email listed on the agenda. Today, uh, the committee will be holding a work session on uh, 11 bills. Um, I would like to remind everyone that we will not be taking testimony at the work session. However, I may call on someone as necessary to answer questions from the committee members. I wanna address really quickly on a change that has been reflected to today's agenda. So before we get started, I would like to note that Senate Bill 336 will not be considered today at this time. Great. All right, let's go ahead and proceed with uh, Senate Bill 78, which is the first on our list, which revises the membership of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, Committee Policy Analyst. And Senate Bill 78 expands the membership of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners as introduced. The bill expands the Board of Wildlife Commissioners from nine to 11 members by adding a member who is licensed as a master guide and a member who is an elected officer representing the governing body of a local political subdivision. The measure increases from one to two the number of members who may be from the same county whose population is less than 100,000. Currently all counties other than Clark and Washoe counties. Um, the Senate Committee on Natural Resources proposes the attached amendment to remove the changes currently proposed in section one and two of SB 78. So that is, those are the provisions adding the two members. So the amendment would keep the board at nine members um, and it would require one of the five members of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners who holds a fishing or hunting license or both to be a master guide provide that a member of the commission serves for a term of three years and that a member can serve for a total of four terms, so a term limit, and provide that a member shall continue to serve on the board until he or she is reappointed by the governor or until a qualified person has been appointed by the governor as a successor, whichever applies. This is to avoid vacancies and allow the board to continue without interruption while appointments may be pending. Um, there was fiscal impact um, for the bill. It was one uh, fiscal note from the Department of Wildlife, and that was for the two additional members. So this proposed amendment may reduce or remove actually that fiscal impact 
Um, but that would be the Department of Wildlife that would need to confirm that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Rudy. Uh, all right. Uh, bef uh, and just as a reminder, uh, before we vote, uh, we do have uh, Director Walsey, uh, Director of the Department of Wildlife, who could comment um, if there's anything um, that would talk about it. The only question that I have before I let uh, my committee members have any questions is, uh, Director Walsey, um, can you please comment if the proposed amendment removes the fiscal impact of this bill to uh, would you would you be able to address that really quickly? Yeah, thank you, Chair Donate. Uh, that fiscal note was related specifically to um, those additional two members of the commission and the additional travel and lodging that would be associated with the statutorily capped uh, nine commission meetings uh, per year. Those are two day meetings occurring uh, typically Friday, Saturdays. Uh, at various geographic locations between Reno, Vegas, and elsewhere in the state. So the additional two members, the travel, the, the per diem, and lodging costs associated with those two additional members is what comprised uh, that fiscal note. Uh, keeping the commission at nine would, in fact, eliminate that fiscal note. Thank you, Director Walsley. All right, uh, any questions? Uh, Senator Gorkichio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I thought we we thought it was a good idea to have uh, two members that could come from counties under 100,000. Was that just a, an error as we drafted it, or is that the intent? Uh, if that was an error, it might have been a mistake. I will defer that question to uh, Mr. Alan Annenberg. Thank you, Chair Janate. Alan Annenberg, for the record. Um, I was under the impression that the intent was to reduce that to one member, but if the intent of the committee is to keep that to, is to increase that number to two members, we can uh, make sure that's reflected in the official amendment. You know, either way is fine with me, but I, you know, I did have talk to some other members and we thought it was a good idea. Unfortunately, the way it is now, if uh, say the cattleman's rep is from Elko County, Elko County truly never gets the ability for a, say a sportsman or a Humboldt County to also serve there typically, uh, you know, those, those first representatives, but uh, maybe poll the board. I don't know what the rest of them think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, some of the committee members and myself agree with the sentiment for that, uh, for it to be two. Um, and I, I'm i comfortable with directing our legal counsel to do that. So thank you, Senator Gorkichia. Um Any other additional questions uh, or clarifications before we move to the roll call vote? Okay, uh, seeing no more questions, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to amend and do pass SB 78 with the inclusion of the change that we're uh, requesting from this uh, moment in time. So uh, do I have a, a motion? So moved, amend and do pass SB 78 with the changes reflected in the work session document with the exception of or the addition of <laughs> allowing two members from the same county to serve on the board. And I lost the placement member where that would go, but hopefully the record is still clear enough. Thank you, Vice Chair Scheibel. Uh, so we have a motion from Vice Chair Scheibel to amend and do pass SB 78. Do we have a second? A second, uh, Chair? Seconded by Senator Brooks. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? All right, uh, will the secretary please proceed to call the roll? Call vote. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goikachia. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Chair Donate. And I am a yes. Great. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, Senator Goikachia, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and handle, uh, I'll let you handle the floor statement for that bill. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, and thank you, committee. All right, uh, let's keep going. Next, we will take uh, Senate Bill 112, which exempts certain products for the treatment of domestic animal, animals from regulation under state law. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, committee policy analyst. 
Uh, the existing law regulates viruses, serums, toxins, and analogous products for use in the treatment of domestic animals, and Senate Bill 112 excludes such products from regulation under Nevada law governing drugs and medicines. Um, Senate Bill 112 was, uh, the bill sponsor worked with the State Board of Pharmacy on the attached amendment that was presented at the hearing. The amendment deletes all sections of the bill except the effective date and instead provides for a veterinary biologic product as specified to be excluded from regulation under Nevada law. These products are to be administered only to certain livestock, specifically cattle, goats, pigs, sheep, and poultry. Um, this is the bill that the testimony indicated that a cure or vaccine had been found for epizootic bovine abortion, also known as foothill abortion in cattle, which is a tick-borne disease. A vaccination of open heifers or cows is the best mode of prevention. And the vaccine was developed by researchers at UC Davis School of Medicine and the and UNR, and it entered the commercial market in September 2020. This bill would allow for the distribution of the vaccine in Nevada under existing federal law. Uh, there were no fiscal notes on this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rudy. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee members at this time? Um, I don't see any. Uh, all right, seeing no questions, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to amend and do pass SB 112. Amend and do pass. Uh, we got a motion from Senator Hansen to amend and do pass SB 112. Do we have a second? Seconded by Senator Goykichia. Uh Is there any discussion on the motion? I don't see any. All right, uh, will the secretary please proceed to call the roll? Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goykichia? Yes. Senator Hansen? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Chair Donate? And I am a yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, we will go ahead and send this to Senator Settlemeyer, who will handle the floor statement for this bill. Thank you, committee members. All right. Next, we will take uh, Senate Bill 114, which authorizes food that contain hemp to be produced or sold at a food establishment under certain circumstances. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, Committee Policy Analyst. Senate Bill 114 authorizes a person who holds a permit to operate a food establishment to purchase hemp or a commodity or product made using hemp from a grower or handler registered by the State Department of Agriculture use hemp or such a commodity or product to manufacture or prepare food that contains hemp and sell, offer, or display for sale or serve food that contains hemp, subject to certain testing and labeling requirements. Nevada's Department of Health and Human Services is required to adopt regulations that identify contaminants of commodities or products, which are foods that contain hemp and prescribe tolerances for such contaminants. Food containing hemp shall not be deemed to be adulterated solely because it contains hemp. The bill sponsor submitted one of the attached amendments at the bill hearing, and it clarifies that the bill applies to food establishments at which food is not prepared or served for immediate consumption. The second amendment that, of course, follows the first one, uh, was proposed by this committee to address concerns raised by the Washoe County Health District. Specifically, it clarifies that the use of hemp or commodities or products made using hemp by persons who operate a food establishment or is conditioned on a determination by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration that such items are safe for human and animal consumption. Um, this bill has been noticed as eligible, uh, can't talk, as eligible for exemption um, due to the fiscal note that was on the bill. There are any questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rudy. Do we have any questions on any of the amendments or anything that has been proposed? And just for clarification, we also have uh, Ms. Teresa Hayes, Environmental Health Program Manager, Division of Public Health and Behavioral Health, uh, DHHS, on, who is on the line if we need any questions from them. But I don't see any committee members with any questions, so I will go ahead and entertain a motion to amend and do pass SB 114. So moved, Senator Scheibel. Uh, we have a motion to amend and do pass from Senator Scheibel for SB 114. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Senator Hansen. All right. Do we have any discussion on the motion or on the bill? 
I don't, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Gorkachia. Yes, I just want to make sure I get a clarification. Is that with all the amendments? Yes. Ms. Rudy? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank all right, uh, I think we're good to go. And I don't see any other discussion. Uh, so that's the clarification, just to make sure that we're voting right now for all the amendments that were included on SB 114. Okay, uh, will the secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Gorgachia. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Chair Donate. And I am a yes. Thank you. All right, uh, the motion carries. Uh, Senator Koikichi, once again, if you can go ahead and handle the floor statement for this bill. Thank, Thank you, committee you. members. Um, and let's keep going. All right, uh, next we will go ahead and take Senate Bill 344, which enacts provisions relating to the importation, possession, sale, transfer, and breeding of dangerous wild animals. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, committee policy analyst. Senate Bill 344 makes it unlawful for, as introduced, makes it unlawful for a person unless he or she meets one of several exemptions to import, possess, sell, transfer, or breed a dangerous wild animal, or allow any member of the public to come in direct contact with a dangerous wild animal. Exempted from this prohibition are certain research facilities, nonprofit organizations, animal shelters, and licensees. Veterinarians and certain law enforcement personnel are authorized to deal with dangerous wild animals in carrying out their duties. Additionally, a person who possesses a dangerous wild animal before July 1, 2021 is allowed to keep that animal if the person meets certain requirements. A law enforcement officer or an animal control agent may seize a wild, dangerous wild animal if the agent believes the owner of the animal has violated certain provisions. A, the two-third majority uh, requirement on the bill is triggered by this next part. A sheriff of Metropolitan Police Department as applicable and the Animal Control Authority may charge and collect reasonable fees for the application for issuance of and renewal of an annual registration in an amount which is equal to an, any administrative and enforcement cost. Such registration must include the number and species of all dangerous wild animals possessed in proof of certain liability insurance. Uh, the bill authorizes the forfeiture or voluntary relinquishment of a seized dangerous animal and provides for the disposition of a dangerous wild animal that is seized, forfeited, or relinquished. A person or entity given temporary custody of a dangerous wild animal may petition a court to gain compensation from the person from whom the animal was seized. Lastly, the bill provides that a violation of the provisions regarding the importation, possession, sale, transfer, or breeding of dangerous wild animals is punishable as a misdemeanor. The bill provides that its provisions must not be construed as prohibiting a county or a city from adopting or enforcing any rule of law that places additional restrictions or requirements on the importation, possession, sale, transfer, or breeding of a dangerous wild animal. The Senate Committee on Natural Resources proposes the attached amendment to address various concerns raised at the hearing and since the hearing. Um, the proposed amendment is in addition to the proposed amendment from uh, Sasha Sutcliffe Stevenson. I'm just so the proposed amendment makes the following changes removes a person who is a member, agent, or officer of a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals from the definition for law enforcement officer. It clarifies that the prohibitions in SB 344 do not apply to a casino or the film industry. It provides a holder of a Class C license for exhibitors uh, 90 days to correct certain revocations, suspensions, official warnings, or stipulations, consent decrees, or settlements before the holder loses its exemption status, removes the requirement that person who is transporting a legally possessed dangerous wild animal through this state provides certain notifications to certain entities at least 72 hours before transporting the legally possessed dangerous wild animal throughout through this state. On the last page, the permissive language for a fee is also deleted, which should remove the two-third majority vote requirement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rudy. Uh, our legal counsel, Alan Ambern, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we entertain any potential questions? Thank you, Chair Janate. Alan Ambern, for the record, I just wanted to bring attention to page two of the proposed amendment where we're adding that language to paragraph C of subsection seven. 
So this is an attempt to give an individual who's a Class C license holder uh, for an exhibitor who has had his or her license or permit for the care, possession, sale, ex exhibition, or breeding of an animal revoked or suspended, or, is it, or who has entered into any stipulation, consent decree, or settlement. Basically, if there's an underlying violation that might prevent that individual or that license holder from maintaining the exemption status that is provided under subsection 7 of section 8, what this new language does is give 90 days for that license holder to correct that underlying violation before they lose their exemption status. So it gives them basically a 90 day window in which to correct the underlying violation. So where they automatically don't lose their exemption status just by having a, um, a violation or, or what have you that they could easily correct. Thank you, Mr. Amber, for that clarification. And I just want to put for the record that our intention for that was to ensure due process. And I know that there are still a few things that we want to tweak with that, just considering the uh, complexities that have come forward because of the COVID-19 pandemic and how that makes uh, timing just a little bit different. And so we want to be respectful of that and just let people know that who are those who of you who are watching that we are trying to address uh, the due process for that, but uh, hopefully we can continue on with that. But I'll give that. Uh, we have uh, just prepared notice. We do have a few representatives uh, who can answer any questions um, on this call. Um, and so for now, I'll turn it back to my committee members if you have any questions on what's being proposed. Senator Brooks. Uh, thank you, Chair Donate. Um, I, more of a statement. I just uh, I think that some of the things that really gave me the, the greatest concern um, about the due process, uh, about grandfathering in um, existing um, um, owners, and as well as the, the thing that gave me the, the most concern was uh, traveling through the state and um, and the film industry and and entertainment, live entertainment, casino shows and things like that we have in, in the state of Nevada. And so thank you for working with folks to get this up to even the last minute um, to a place where I feel comfortable with it now, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Brooks. Uh, Senator Gricuccio, and then Senator Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do need to just get a little clarification. Okay, everyone would have to be licensed, right? At, at least at a, with a Class C or better. Is that correct? I will defer that question to either Mr. Amber who could answer that. And if not, we have uh, representatives who can help that answer too. Thank you, Chair Donate, Alan Amburn. So that is one of the exemption statuses under Section 8. Basically, Section 8 is providing a series of exemptions from the prohibition in um, Section 7. And I do apologize, looking at the amendment on page 1, it's listed as Section 1, but that is actually Section 8. That is a typo, so I do apologize for that confusion. So among those list of exemption statuses is a holder of a Class C license for exhibitors, and that is a federal license. And so under that, we're talking about the uh, film productions, the zoological parks, the circuses, resort hotel, basically entities that would have to comply with that federal licensure requirement. If I may, Mr. Chair, uh, just another clarification, but anyone that did not fit that exemption category then would either be uh, grandfathered in or it would be illegal for them to hold those animals. Alan Ambern, again, for the record, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there is that grandfathering uh, section that is section nine that basically applies to an individual who currently possesses such an animal. And there are certain um, conditions that would apply to that grandfathering clause. Yes, that grandfathering clause still does apply um, pursuant to this amendment. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Good Chair, Senator Hansen. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to compliment you, too, for uh, getting these amendments on. Uh, I had some major concerns. I think we're almost there. I'll probably still vote no, because honestly, I haven't got the chance to meet some of the folks that are really concerned about it. But I do want to thank you for that, because it's definitely uh, watered way down from the dangerous kind of bill it was originally. So I'm going to vote no, but uh, we'll see what happens after I talk to some people that are in this industry, see what they think about the, about the bill. And I thank you for the... Uh, a great deal of effort you put into trying to make everybody happy on this one. Not an easy task. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Uh, any other last minute questions? Right, Senator Gorkichia? Yes, I, uh, because I do have the um, the majority of those people that do in fact own and 
hops these wild animals that won't fit the criteria, although clearly they're grandfathered in. I know there's a lot of concern. Uh, they are my constituents. I'm here to represent them. So unfortunately, I, I appreciate the work you've done on it. We got a lot closer, uh, but I will have to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gorgicchia. All right, uh, if I don't see any, I don't think I see any other last minute questions. So at this moment in time, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to amend and do pass SB 344. So moved, Senator Scheibel. We have a motion to amend and do pass from SB 344 from Vice Chair Scheibel. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second from Senator Brooks. Uh, do we have any other discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, will the secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goykechia. No. Senator Hansen. No. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Chair Donate. And I am a yes. Uh, motion carries. I will go ahead and assign this to Senator Orrin Shaw, who will handle the floor statement for his bill. Uh, thank you, committee members. Uh, next, we will go ahead and hear uh, Senate Bill 349, which provides provisions relating to public health. Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, committee policy analyst. Senate Bill 349 excludes certain materials from the provisions governing the disposal of solid waste and provides that the State Board of Health or a local Board of Health may not adopt regulations that prohibit the sale of unpackaged produce at a, at a licensed farmer's market. Specifically, the bill excludes compostable materials that are inoculated with an effective microorganism and placed in sealed containers for a length of time sufficient for fermentation to occur under anaerobic conditions and promote acidification of the materials and delivered promptly to a person who holds a certificate as an actual producer of farm products issued by the State Department of Agriculture or who is approved to receive the materials by a person or governmental entity that has been accredited as a certifying agent pursuant to the National Organic Program of the United States Department of Agriculture. These compostable materials are excluded from the waste that is collected and disposed of per waste management services authorized by certain local governments. The provisions impacting waste service franchises do not apply to certain contracts awarded before October 1, 2021, unless the contract is amended, extended, or renewed on or after October 1, 2021. The Senate Committee on Natural Resources proposes the attached amendment to address concerns raised at the hearing. Um, it deletes sections 134 and 6 of Senate Bill 349 relating to the compostable um, materials. It also amends sections 2, 5, and 7 of SB 349 to clarify that the State Board of Health and local boards of health shall not prohibit the sale of unpackaged produce at a farmer's market and may instead regulate the sale of unpackaged produce at farmer's markets. It adds a new section to Chapter 278 of the NRS that authorizes the governing body of a city or county to establish an urban composting zone by ordinance for the purpose of promoting the development and operation of urban composting. Um, it amends 278.150 and 278.160 to provide that a master plan also include an urban composting element. It adds new sections to chapters 244 and 268 of NRS that authorize a governing body of a city or county to establish by ordinance the terms and conditions for the use of land owned by the city or county for the purpose of community composting. Um, it provides that the new provisions authorizing the establishment of urban composting zones or community composting do not apply to any contract for the exclusive franchise to provide waste services that is awarded before October 1, 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rudy. Uh, do we have any questions from any of the committee members at this time? Senator Gorgicchio. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just need to get some clarification. I'm digging through the amendment. Uh, I apologize for not getting in, into it deep enough. Uh, I, you know, the first half of the bill I'm I'm in love with. I, <laughs> I really like it. Uh, I'm just concerned about. Okay, now everything that relates to uh, then this urban composting zone uh, will be determined by local ordinance, not state law. Uh, as I understand it, and I think that's, you know, composting is hard work. I just want to make sure that people don't 
put these buckets together and then go ahead and start think they're comp composting it in uh, in a bucket they're sitting in their garage or someplace and and end up with nobody there to come and pick it up or and then it becomes bad garbage and uh, ultimately if we roll it out to the curb and uh, looking for your regular carrier to move it, I'm sure it's going to be a problem. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable with it, and I do appreciate the, the fact that uh, the governing body will, in fact, by ordinance through public hearings, can, in fact, create these zones, and let's give it a try. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Gopichir. Yeah, that was exactly my concern as well with the amendment. I wanted to make sure that we can provide the support and power to the local counties and jurisdictions to make their own decision as to how they'd like to proceed forward. So that was kind of the intention of it. But uh, I don't know if Mr. Allen Ember wants to also contribute or do you have anything else before we go to Senator Hansen? You good? Okay, Senator Hansen. Uh, the question on the local government, is this mandatory on them that they have to come up with a policy or is it option? Uh, I think I know the answer to that, but I will defer to Mr. Allen Ember. Thank you, Chair Donati, Alan Amber. So this authorizes the local governments to carry this out if the local government so decides to. It basically gives them that authority, but it's not a requirement. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I don't see any other questions. Uh, and I just want to clarify that, you know, that there might be some things that we want to address um, on the floor just to make a few clarifications, but I think the uh, where it stands, it's it's good. So, at this time, uh, I will go ahead and attend uh, entertain a motion to amend and do pass uh, SB three forty nine. I'd make a motion to amend do pass. Uh, we got a motion to amend and do pass by Senator Brooks. Do we have a seconded? Second, Senator Scheibel. We have a second from second seconded from Senator Sche Vice Chair Scheibel. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? No. All right. Well, the secretary, please proceed to call the roll call vote. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goykechia. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Chair Donate. And I am a yes. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Uh, I'll again, I will give this to Senator Orange Shaw, who will handle the floor standing for this bill. And thank you to my committee members for your questions. Next, we will take uh, Senate Bill 370, which revises provisions relating to food policy. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, committee policy analyst. Senate Bill 370 requires the director of the State Department of Agriculture to purchase through the donated commodities account nutritious food for the established supplemental food program from growers and producers operating in the state if the director cannot obtain nutritious food from such persons from food manufacturers operating in the state or if the director cannot obtain nutritious food from such persons from food vendors operating in the state. This bill additionally requires the director to distribute the food to emergency food, food service providers or if an emergency food service provider is not operating in an area or is not in need of additional nutritious foods, food banks. This bill requires such emergency food service providers and food banks to distribute the nutritious food to persons, emergency food pantries, soup kitchens, and homeless shelters based on need within the boundaries that the emergency food service provider or food bank operates. Finally, this bill, as introduced, requires the director, emergency food service providers, and food banks to submit annual written reports containing certain information to the Council on Food Security. The attached amendment was submitted by Three Square Food Bank and the Food Bank of Northern Nevada. The amendment requires the director of the State Department of Agriculture to establish a new supplemental food program, Home Feeds Nevada Agriculture Food Purchase Program, for such purposes identified in the attached program. So while it deletes most of the provisions of the bill, it it, um, it does sort of transfer those over to this new program and replaces um, and also keeps the annual report in this uh, amendment too. Thank you, Ms. Rudy, for that presentation. Uh, do we have any, and just to let the community members know, we do have um, individuals available from the various food banks that presented on this bill to answer any questions that you may have. And I believe that they sent us uh, a few documents via email uh, to help address any of the questions that were mentioned at the hearing. So uh, do we have any questions at this time? Senator Brooks. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm looking at the amendment, and I, I'm, I apologize for not catching this earlier, but um, this has the, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm, I'm trying to find the, the, the actual language that, so on the, on the Council on Food Security, and this is, is requiring them to submit a plan and make a report. Did we? Did anyone get back to us on on what impact that might have on their operations? Or I mean, are they going to have new, need more resources, more people, or anything like that? Uh, thank you, Senator Brooks. Uh, I don't know, if, Alan. Do you think you can try answering that, or I can try to figure out who's on the call right now? Thank you, Chair Donate, Alan Amber, for the record. Uh, that is um, not a question that's necessarily in my wheelhouse to answer. Thank you, Mr. Amber. Uh, I believe we have um, Mr. Shane. If, please, please, I think you're on it. So if you're here, please proceed. Okay. I think I would have this mute thing down by now. I apologize. Um, good afternoon, Shane. Pitching any for the record. Um, Thank you, um, Senator Brooks, through you to the chair. So the idea was, uh, well, the food, the Governor's Council on Food Security um, is already working on a number of, of different facets of what a statewide food security plan would look like. So um, I don't think that that would be, um, that, that the report that we would be, um, be bringing back would be um, per, you know, like a huge strain on that or on the Office of Food Security um, and the Department of HHS. We part the main reason for the reporting was to make sure that um, there was transparency in the work that was being done by both food banks and the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Does that help answer your question? I hope. I, I think so. I, it's really more their their issue. They, they, they'll let us know if it's going to cost them some more money and and. Uh, have more resources necessary. I was just curious. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any other questions on this bill? I don't think I see any. Um, all right. Uh, do I have a, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to amend and do pass uh, SB 370 at this time. So moved, Mr. Chair. Looks like we got a, a motion from Senator Hansen to amend and do pass. Do we have a second? Uh, second, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Senator Brooks. Uh, do we have any discussion? I don't see any. All right. Will the secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Goykechia? Yes. Senator Hansen? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Chair Donate? I am a yes. Motion carries. Um, and I will go ahead and take the floor statement on this committee bill. Thank you, committee members. All right, uh, we're almost there. So next we will go ahead and take uh, Senate Bill 400, which makes various changes to certain unlawful acts relating to consumer protection. Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, committee policy analyst. Senate Bill 400 revises the penalties for certain unlawful acts relating to weights and measures, public weighing, petroleum products, and advertisements of motor vehicle, fuel, and petroleum products. A person or any officer, agent, or employee thereof who willfully commits such unlawful acts may be punished by, one, for the first offense, a warning, two, for the second offense, a misdemeanor with a fine of not less than 1,000 or not more than 5,000, and three, for the third or any subsequent offense, a gross misdemeanor. However, if a person or an officer, agent, or employee thereof has been convicted three or more times in a two-year period of any such unlawful act, the person, officer, agent, or employee is guilty of a Category E felony. The State Sealer of Consumer Equitability is required to adopt regulations establishing a schedule of civil penalties for the commission of certain unlawful acts relating to petroleum products. Finally, the bill establishes procedures for an administrative hearing if requested by a person who is subject to a civil penalty. There are no amendments for this measure. There were three fiscal notes and they were all um, showing zero impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rudy. Uh, any questions from any of the committee members at this time? 
Uh, I don't see any. All right, let's keep going. Uh, I don't see any questions, so seeing no questions, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to do pass SB 400. Motion do pass. We got a motion to do pass from Senator Goykechia, and we got a seconded from Senator Hansen. Uh, do we have any questions or discussion? All right, will the secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goykechia. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Chair Donate. And I am a yes. Uh, motion carries. Uh, does anyone on the committee would like to volunteer for that support statement? Senator Hansen, thank you for volunteering. All right. Uh, great, thank you. So he will take the floor statement on SB 400. Thank you, committee members. Uh, next, we will go ahead and take Senate Bill 404, which revises provisions relating uh, to governing cat cannabis. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, committee policy analyst. Senate Bill 404 authorizes the state sealer of consumer equitability to adopt and enforce regulations relating to cannabis weighing and measuring equipment. The state sealer of consumer equitability must ensure through inspection and testing that cannabis weighing and measuring equipment are suitable for their intended use, are properly installed and accurate, and are so maintained by their owner or user. It is prohibited for a person to have an incorrect weight or measure in his or her possession in a cannabis establishment and for a person to sell or offer to sell an incorrect weight or measure for use in a cannabis establishment. The state sealer of consumer equitability may establish an annual license fee for all cannabis weighing and measuring equipment. And that is the section, um, that is section nine, and that is what triggered the two third majority vote of requirement for the bill. There was one uh, fiscal note on the bill and it showed zero impact. Thank you. And there are no amendments for this measure. Thank you, Ms. Rudy. Um, I think my understanding is that there might have been an amendment that could come forward, but you can address that at a later time. So, uh, uh, do we have any questions from any of the committee members? Yeah, I don't see any. All right. Uh, I will go ahead and entertain a motion at this time for SB 44 to do pass, correct? Do pass? Yep. Move do pass, uh, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Okay. And we got a motion from Senator Brooks and a second from Senator Hansen. Uh, any questions or discussion? Uh, I don't see none. All right. Uh, will the Secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Goykechia? Yes. Senator Hansen? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Chair Donate? And I am a yes. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Uh, would anyone like to volunteer to take on this floor statement? Hold on, I think. I'm going to, if it's okay, I'll give it to Senator Brooks. Great. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we got, I think we got two more bills, so we're almost there. Uh, so next, we will go ahead and take Senate Bill 406, which revises provisions relating to wildlife. Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, Committee Policy Analyst again. Senate Bill 406 exempts private, well, it, it does kind of three different things. Um, the first one is it exempts private money accepted by the Department of Wildlife for deposit in the Wildlife Trust Fund from certain requirements of existing law for the acceptance of gifts by a state agency, the director of the department or the director's designee fund, and the investment and expenditure of the money in the fund from the previous fiscal year. The second thing it does, the bill authorizes the department to designate a paper or electronic form for a tag that is to be attached to a species of wildlife before the holder of a tag takes possession of the species and an electronic tag must be validated before the holder of the tag transports the species of wildlife. Then the third thing, finally, the bill removes the requirement that any person 65 years of age or older must have continuously resided in the state for the five years immediately preceding the date of the application to qualify for an annual resident specialty combination hunting and fishing license. The Senate Committee on Natural Resources proposes a conceptual amendment so there isn't something attached uh, to remove the proposed changes to NRS 501.3585 and 353.335 
and uh, the proposed conceptual amendment would delete sections one and seven of SB 406, and those are the provisions uh, related to the exempting of the private money. Uh, there was only one fiscal note on the bill. It was from the Department of Wildlife, and it showed zero fiscal impact. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rudy, and thank you for clarifying the conceptual amendment, which, um, of course, is not reflected on the bill right now, but thank you for just documenting that for the committee's purposes. Um, so much appreciated. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee members at this time? Uh, Senator Hansen. Uh, no uh, questions, more of a comment. Thank you for your hard work on amending this bill at this time. And when you're ready, I'd like to make a motion to amend and do pass. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a motion from Senator Hansen to amend and do pass. And do we have a second? Second, I'll second. From <laughs> Scheibel, I, and all right. Uh, any discussion on the motion to amend and do pass? No, uh, we don't got any, so. All right, uh, will our secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Goykachia? Yes. Senator Hansen? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Chair Donate? And I am a yes. Uh, motion carries, and I will go ahead and take the floor statement on, on this bill. Thank you, committee. And we have reached that final point, which we are now our, our last bill of today. Uh, Senate Bill 407, which enacts provisions relating to apiaries. Uh, Ms. Rudy, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Donate. This is Jennifer Rudy, Committee Policy Analyst. Senate Bill 407 requires the State Department of Agriculture to adopt regulations pursuant to which a person is registered is required to register apiaries. This bill exempts a person from the registration requirement if the person obtains certification as an actual producer of certain farm products and the certification includes the registration of all apiary locations under the control of the person. Additionally, this bill requires a person who is required to register his or her apiary to pay an annual registration fee that is established by the department in regulation. And it is that annual registration fee that um, triggered the two third majority provision on the bill. There was only one um, fiscal note submitted. It's from the Department of Agriculture and it showed zero impact there is, however, um, one amendment, and it is from the Senate Committee on Natural Resources proposing to amend SB 407 to exempt a hobbyist beekeeper, which would be defined as a person who has not more than 10 apiaries under his or her possession or control from the annual registration fee. And that was in response to concerns raised at the committee hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rudy. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee members on the amendment? Uh, Senator Goykichia. Yes, thank you. And uh, I haven't been around a lot of bees in my life, but uh, uh, an apiary is a, is a hive, I assume. Is there a designation how big a hive is? Uh, I mean, can it be 40 by 40 and that's one? Thank you, Senator Goykichia. Uh, I think I would deflect that answer to Mr. Alan Amburn, uh, I don't know if you can answer that, but, and we also have, uh, I believe on the line, a few administrators who presented on this bill, and I can also defer to them if Alan can answer, so. Thank you, Chair Donate. I'll defer to the statute. So uh, according to NRS 552-0851, an apiary is any hive or other place where bees are kept, located, or found, and all appliances used in connection therewith. The chapter also defines a hive to mean any receptacle or container made or prepared for the use of bees. So it doesn't necessarily provide a uh, description on like number of limits, but it does describe those terms in statute. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Amber. Uh, I'll, Senator Grickich, before you get a clarification, I'll, I'll defer to uh, Megan Brown, who's a deputy administrator of plant industry, division of State Department of Agriculture, who can go ahead and chime in. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Megan Brown for the record. And I think that um, definition is sufficient unless Senator Gokuchia has something more specific. Uh, no, I don't. I, would, I just wanted a clarification of that. Uh, and of course, I know you know, Ms. Brown, there, there are people that might press this. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Gokuchia. Uh, any other questions on this bill? 
Uh, I don't see none, so let's go ahead. I, at this time, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to amend and do pass SB 407. I'd like to move to amend and do pass SB 407. We have a motion to amend and do pass SB 407 from Vice Chair Scheibel. Do we have a second? It looks like okay. Senator Brooks is on it, so seconded by Senator Brooks. Uh, is there any discussion? Senator Hansen. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to vote no. I think the amendment's great. I think it makes it go in the right direction, but I'm not going to do any bad puns, man. This, these, these beat bills have more puns than anybody on the planet's ever heard. But uh, I, I still think we're kind of regulating something that's already got enough levels of regulation. So even with the 10, uh, 10 AP areas and all that, I, I still think I, I'd rather not see this law go forward. Lots and lots of beat people in my district, and I, I know they're very uncomfortable having the government looking over this whole area. Any more than they already are. So I'll, I'll be in Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Senator Hansen. Do we have any other discussion before we proceed to the roll call vote? Senator Gregorio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I think I, I will. I'll vote for this in favor of it. Uh, I realize there it is an issue down south, and I do have parts of my district down south. Uh, you know, we're seeing more and more of them, and. Uh, uh, so I think there is, especially in Southern Nevada, needs to be some regulation. So I'll, I'll support the bill. Thank you, Senator Gorkichi. And I just wanted to clarify that part of the amendment was that I didn't want to put the barrier for people who are hobbyists. And so we try to address that, which by not making them pay for registration. So I hope that addresses a lot of the concerns that we received from the testimony uh, last, a few days ago. So uh, any other questions or discussion before we proceed to the roll call vote? Uh, I don't see none. All right. Uh, will the secretary please proceed to call the roll call vote? Senator Brooks? Yes. Senator Goykachia? Yes. Senator Hansen? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Chair Donate? And I am a yes. Uh, thank you, committee members. I will go ahead and assign this floor statement on SB 407 to Vice Chair Scheibel, if that's okay. Uh, thank you, committee members. Uh, that concludes our work session for today. Uh, public comment, uh, let's go ahead and move with that. So I will go ahead and call for public comment. So please remember to limit your comments to two minutes each. Uh, BPS staff, is there any public comment at this time? Thank you, Chair Donate. The public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Let's leave it a, a few seconds just in case if anyone wants to join. Certainly, Chair, no problem. Thank you, BPS standing by. Well, thank you, Chair. The public line is still open working and there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. Uh, before we conclude, and uh, do we have any comments or questions or concerns from the members? Senator Hansen. Actually, I just want to compliment you uh, for running a very good committee today. We went through a lot of bills. Some of them were quite controversial. You did some excellent work on amending to try to make everybody as reasonably happy as possible. So congratulations. Thank you, Senator Hansen, and thank you for uh, being open and transparent with me and helping me fix some of these concerns on all bills that we've had uh, throughout the session. So uh, anything else from any of the committee members before we adjourn? Uh, I don't see any. I just want to share a really quick note um, that I want to share my deep, uh, deep and sincere gratitude to our committee staff. Um, you know, uh, Jennifer Rudy, Alan Amber, uh, Roberta Cox, Christine Miner, you know, I know that it's difficult trying to gauge everything that's happened with, especially as we get close to deadlines. So thank you to those of you who are helping out and, you know, helping with the last minute requests. And also I'd like to share um, my deep gratitude and my thankfulness to the committee members who have mentored me throughout these past few weeks and or months um, to get to this point. So eh, it was definitely difficult, but without you guys uh, and your mentorship, I probably wouldn't uh, have gotten to 
a smooth work session today. So thank you for that. Uh, all right. Uh, so our next meeting is on Tuesday, April 13th at 3.30 p.m. And this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much.